to welcome you all to this seminar today with uh, Dr. Greg Mills, where he will present his new book entitled Why States Recover. You see the book here. He, Dr. Uh, Mills has offered a special prize today for those of you who want to buy uh, the book. My name is Kari Uslan and I'm a senior research fellow at um, the research group uh, for peace operations and peace building. I'm also the head of that research group. Dr. Greg Mills has since 2005 directed the Johannesburg-based Brent Hurst Foundation. Previously from 1996 to 2005, he was the national director of the South African Institute of International Affairs, a sister institute of NUPI. Mills undertook four deployments with ISAF in Afghanistan between 2006 and 2012, including as the commander's advisor and head of the PRISP strategic analysis group. In 2013, he was appointed member of the African Development Bank's high-level panel on fragile states. And he is a visiting fellow, senior fellow at several universities and defense colleges. After Greg Mills' presentation, my good colleague and senior research fellow here at NUPI, Dr. Elis Stavnes, will act as a discussant. Dr. Stavnes, she is an expert on UN peace operations, peace building, and uh, the concept of R2P. After Eli's comments, I will open the floor for questions and answers and comments. So on that note, I will give the word to Dr. Greg Mills. That's on? Yes, okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here at NUPI uh, to talk to you a little bit about this um, book that I've produced, this uh, heavyweight tome, if nothing else, at least in terms of volume. Uh, and I certainly hope that uh, it's the first of many exchanges around this topic um, uh, on a subject which I have, as you've heard, uh, been professionally involved in over the past uh, decade. Um, what I want to really talk to you about today is, is, is a number of different things. Firstly, uh, why I wrote this book. Um, secondly, what I understand by state fragility and state recovery, um, and why this is especially important to Africa. And then I'm going to look at five different case studies in success, um, one a little bit less so than others. Uh, and don't worry, Ambassador, it's not uh, South Africa I'm referring to. Um, and then I'm going to make some pointers in conclusion about, about why it is that states uh, recover. Uh, but before I do all of that, uh, let me say thank you sincerely to NUPI for, for hosting this. Uh, and, it's, uh, and to my good friend and colleague, Ambassador Torben Brilla, uh, who's a member of the Brenthurst Foundation's Advisory Board, uh, for enabling this uh, to take place. I want to tell you a little bit before I start, however, about why it is that I ended up working uh, for the Oppenheimer family and what we do. Uh, as has been mentioned, uh, I spent 10 years as director of the South African Institute of International Affairs before creating this foundation back at the end of 2004. Uh, and in a sense, uh, the last 10 years has been about finding out what it is that we do and where we do it better than other respects. And it really came about because the Oppenheimers uh, wanted to work in the uh, policy advisory space um, and approach me to establish the foundation to work with African governments at the invitation of African governments to help them on economic and development policies. So we work um, across a spectrum of state activity, this type of spectrum that's reflected in the, the sorts of case studies in this book. We help principally, we have helped, to try and find the means to help to stabilize fragile states, hence the types of deployments not only in Africa but elsewhere. 
Uh, we've worked extensively, and I'll come back to this in a second, in Rwanda. I spent the uh, uh, best part of a year working as President Kagame's advisor in Rwanda in helping principally to set up the Rwandan Development Board, uh, but worked also in Liberia, uh, uh, among other countries uh, in this context too. One of our key roles has been to try and uh, understand what best practice is uh, in terms of policy, particularly those countries uh, engaging um, uh, in, uh, with, with trying to in instill higher rates of economic growth uh, and in trying to uh, um, really get development uh, working uh, advantage, better for their advantage. And what we try and do here is not tell people what it is that they should be doing. We try and expose people to development best practice, whether, uh, and these are from countries that have performed better than others uh, over the last uh, generation. We've taken study trips to Central America, to Colombia, uh, one last month to Singapore to focus on ports and customs, and we tend to focus on very narrow areas about how it is that better choices and better policy uh, have worked to the advantage of countries and how these might tr uh, travel across borders in this regard. Um, we have, as I've not only in Africa um, uh, and in most recently uh, focused uh, particularly our energies on Malawi, where we ran the Presidential Advisory Committee on the Economy, but have also for a long time ran the Presidential International Advisory Board of Mozambique. And Overall, I suppose our mission has been to try and build constituencies for development and for growth, um, uh, both inside African countries uh, and also outside in terms of helping to shape aid policy in better ways uh, and so forth. So what we have really been concerned about uh, is, uh, over the last 10 years, are, are issues around people, people and how population demographics has changed in Africa, how it's changing, and how in particular, not just in nominal numerical terms, but how this is shaping demographic differences in Africa, uh, and also particularly, and this is something we're working on a great deal going forward, how this is going to impact on African cities. We've also been interested in differentiation, forgive my, uh, my uh, uh, lewd comment in that regard, I mean, it's not a long time ago that Africa was just thought of as one single entity, as one single place. Uh, and from the early 2000s, uh, myself and a colleague of mine, Jeff Herbst, have spoken continuously about the importance of differentiating the continent. We are no more like Somalia in South Africa uh, than Somalia is like Sierra Leone. And we need to see the continent and the development responses in a highly differentiated uh, um, uh, way, uh, and that's incumbent not only on Africans themselves to encourage that v differentiated view, but also of development partners in that process. As I've mentioned already, we've spent a lot of time in areas emerging from conflict and those sometimes descending into it, and trying to find better ways to do this has been a key focus of our activities, uh, running uh, peace-building uh, uh, conferences, sending peace-building teams to understand how it is that people have done things better or badly, and building uh, strategic partnerships has been very important too. Also around natural resource management, it's been a key focus naturally of a family that uh, made its fortune in the natural resource area to try and find ways to manage natural resources better, and in particular to diversify away from natural resources. Um, our big challenge in Africa, need I tell you, Ambassador, is of course jobs. We need to find ways to add value to natural resources, but we also need to find ways uh, to become more competitive so that we are not only seen as an area uh, of natural resource uh, extraction, but that we are seen as a place that can hold its own against other countries which where our advantage is not just about the comparative uh, um, presence of natural resources. So that's something we have focused on a great deal. And then as an institution, we have been very field work driven. Uh, this book is based on 40 different case studies, all of which are based on field work. When people say to me, why didn't you include country X? The answer sometimes is just simply because I have had no personal professional experience of being there or of working there. So this is really in many ways a journey of the last 10 years about the places that we have operated and worked in. And we are very much, I, I firmly believe that your eyes never lie. Uh, but you should also only believe half of what you see. 
So um, it's very important to see things with your own eyes, to actually understand the context, to deal with the players, to deal with the policy uh, figures, rather than do this from the comparative safety and privilege of your desktop. Um, and then I, I think our overall mission has been avoiding constituencies of losers. Stop seeing development as a zero-sum game, which is very important and which often characterizes many of these failures uh, um, uh, in a very mercantilist uh, formulation, but to overall to try and build constituencies for growth, constituencies for development, constituencies for competitiveness. This has been very much the foundation's mantra. And, you know, this sounds like a bit of an advert, but it's, it's, it's been a, a lot of work in a lot of these countries, and I'm just going to flick through this, um, whether it be um, Colombia, where we've spent a great deal of time. We took a, a senior group of African military and political leaders led by former President Abbasanjo, who is my chairman, uh, and infu including uh, former President uh, Pierre Boyoya, to, who's of course now the uh, AU representative for the Sahel and uh, to Mali, uh, to um, Colombia earlier this year to learn from the Colombian experience, and I'll come back to that in a second. But there have been a multitude of missions, uh, both on the best practice, both on both also working more directly with African governments. I spent some time in the Danish Africa Commission as well, uh, dealing with uh, some of these issues and trying to formulate them uh, in a way that affected uh, European uh, policy or a policy of a European country towards Africa. Uh, and then, of course, uh, um, worked with uh, a variety of figures uh, in southern Africa and elsewhere. And in fact, in many respects, this book is, a, is the third of a trilogy. The first book being Why Africa's Poor, the second being this book about Africa's third liberation. The first liberation being, of course, uh, liberation from people who look like me. Uh, uh, the second liberation being from the liberators themselves, sorry, Ambassador. Uh, and the third liberation being from the old statist ways of doing things. Uh, um, the same sort of inherited sets of policies, and this is really the third of this trilogy. As I said, it's based on a lot of field work. Uh, as the chair, chair has already indicated, uh, I've done a lot of work in Afghanistan. In particular, I, I did uh, the route diagnostics from Pakistan uh, to Kandahar and to Helmand uh, back in 2010 on a 45,000 litre fuel tanker, and I'll come back to this in a second too. Um, but this is an illustration of the types of field work that we have tried to specialize in as a foundation, uh, which has not been easy. I mean, as you'll take from this, this has not been, it wasn't a particularly easy thing to try and do. But it's, that's where, in this very overtraded environment, uh, which is the advisory business, and I think it's becoming m more so rather than less so, how a small foundation can add comparative advantage to those people making decisions around these issues. A lot of time spent in joyous places like Spin Boldak. Anybody here been to Spin Boldak? Ah, oh, you have been. There you go. Um, uh, and then, as I said, already working with uh, President Kagami. And one of the key bits of work there was also to do a route diagnostic uh, from uh, Mombasa to, uh, to Kigali, and also route diagnostics from South Africa into Central uh, Africa, uh, um, and understanding why it is that things flowed and why it is that things didn't flow. And that's one of the overarching themes of this book, actually, is to understand why things happen, but to understand why things don't happen. Because things don't happen, usually for a reason, just as much as they do happen for sets of reasons. And more recently, uh, a lot of work on the Mombasa, um, uh, uh, Nairobi rail line. But let me turn to some of these issues around, more specifically, the book. Uh, I think it's very important to s understand countries as a spectrum of failure or fragility rather than just as a failed state per se. There's no imaginary tipping point by which countries become failed. They don't suddenly uh, descend into failure. Um, and there's a whole variety of indices, of course, measuring countries which are more or less risky or more likely to be failed. But I think the first important point to make is that there's a spectrum of failure out there, there's a spectrum of fragility, there's different types of failure. And I would characterize at least there being three different types of failure. The first is the obvious one, where there's collapse of the state, uh, where state centralized institutions no longer exhibit the characteristics by which you have, in you know, which they're supposed to carry out their basic functions. And, and Somalia, as depicted here, would be an uh, example of that. Of course, you can have 
elements of failure existing side by side with actually elements of excellence. And that's why it's so difficult to discern what exactly is failure. You can have pockets of extreme poverty, uh, extreme despair, no state activity, and then you can have things that work very well but for a small uh, ordered elite who gain maximum benefit from the state and from the services. Uh, um, you know, I'm also, even in conditions of outright failure, even in Somalia during the worst of times, uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, the, the rate of the Somali shilling was set every day uh, in Bakara market uh, on a regular basis. There was no state required for that. So in some things, there's still the functions of statehood, but in fact the state is not at the center of them. So I think we have to be very careful about how we ascribe failure in these circumstances, and we need to see it thus on the spectrum. Uh, a second basic type of failure is a failure of meeting the aspirations of people uh, in terms of what the state can provide in terms of an overall framework. Uh, educational framework and infrastructural framework. This doesn't necessarily descend into anarchy or violence, but the state basically isn't doing its job properly. And this particularly matters where you have this groundswell, as we saw with the Arab Spring, of a, a large uh, a, a youthful body of people, highly energetic, highly aspirational, uh, um, and the state unable to meet their expectations in a whole variety of measures. And the third type of failure, I would argue, is a failure of democracy. It's where you particularly you have uh, not just the obvious collapse of uh, representative democratic systems, but where you have countries that look to be democratic, they have the facade of democratic institutions, uh, but they don't have the inner stuffings. They don't have the attitudinal or the institutional uh, mechanisms that go with uh, democracies. And this is important because the book goes into this in some detail as to why it is and how democracies have performed generally better in developmental terms uh, over the last 25 years. Why then does this, these, do these sorts of failures occur? Uh, and from the case studies, uh, I think it's important to see, understand state fragility in at least three different types of measures or drivers. The first is a societal driver, where you have uh, different fault lines, uh, the attitude of elites, for example, working uh, hand in hand with uh, uh, questions or more deeply rooted questions of land tenure, absence of a free media educational systems, and also the zero-sum culture that I refer to, the notion that if I have something you don't, or if you have something I don't, is a very important part of the societal element that makes up uh, failure. And of course, all of this compounded by high rates of population growth. A, th a second driver of state fragility is that of governance. Uh, for example, portrayed by when you have weak institutions, uh, where there's a lack of accountability, weak institutional accountability, often where there's a very limited tax base, where the tax base is only uh, acting on a certain segment of society. Uh, there's no sense of buy-in, and there's no responsibility flowing in the other direction. Uh, where a culture of corruption has taken sway, uh, whereas the, the notion of the state really being run or society being run off the books is the norm for example. Uh, and this, this facade of democracy uh, is also a part of this process, as is overwhelmingly the act, the failure to act or to execute uh, plans against vision, plans against pronouncements, plans against policy, to operationalize visions, a very important part of the governance dimension, which often you see uh, in these conditions of failure. And the third, of course, very importantly, is where you have different uh, um, where the economy uh, uh, lends itself to conditions of fragility. And this is different for different countries, obviously. There are those countries which are pre-modern, indeed pre-market in many respects, sometimes even pre-feudal. Uh, South Sudan, I would characterize in this regard uh, elements indeed of Afghanistan, in the, particularly in the rural areas. Uh, um, these are very pastorally based, what uh, anthropologists called segmentary lineage societies, uh, um, uh, often very patrimonial, uh, uh, where l land use is seen as, as a subsistence, not a developmental tool. There's no collateralization of land value, for example. There's no respect for any order outside of the immediate communal or community in which you operate. 
uh, often characterized too by low population density. Um, African countries which have performed better historically are smaller. They have higher rates of population density. It doesn't necessarily mean that larger countries with, uh, with, uh, shouldn't do better, but historically they have done very poorly. And there seems to be a correlation between low population density, large areas to govern, uh, and we can come back to this in the Q&A, and poor economic performance, and smaller is generally, in economic terms, easier, of course, to manage. High rates, uh, high degrees of natural resource dependency often lend themselves to unrestrained rent-seeking in this regard, uh, compounded by limited banking availability, bankability of the population, poor infrastructure, and then you get into the cycle of a, a very weak private sector, low growth, and that cycle compounds itself in the following way. And I'm not going to go into this in any great detail. It's in the book for those of you who'd like to get a copy. Um, uh, you can have them at the author's price, which is, I think, by, by uh, Norwegian standards, uh, very cheap. It's about a cost of a glass of water in the restaurant. We had meal in last night, um, uh, or maybe a half a glass of water. Um, uh, and and I'll, I'll definitely report back to Pretoria, Ambassador, on the cost of living here, um, <laughs> uh, where you have uh, institutional weakness, uh, and then you have these series of compounding issues, particularly this very short-term uh, set of actions, short-term mindset, living till tomorrow, living until next year, living until the next election, perhaps, a, a failure to invest in people, often where you have identity politics ruling over issues. Now, this could be identity on racial grounds, my country, of course, world champions in this regard, uh, or, or ethnic grounds or religious grounds, CAR, for example, at the moment, particularly important in an, an environment of scarce resources, uh, lending itself often to widening corruption, uh, a very small, isolated, often preyed upon private sector in these environments, highly politicized institutions, and so on and so forth. And it, you get into very quickly a vicious cycle, very hard to see yourself getting out of this. And where you do manage to get out of it, the period of recovery is at least as long as the period of decline. One of the sad rules, as it were, or axioms about state recovery, it takes a very long time to get out of this sort of viciousness uh, that you see portrayed here. Um, and here you have, uh, where you have a collapse of governmental authority, you see a subversion of d democracy. And I don't only mean this, and I've just come from two months in Singapore, and every time I spoke about subversion of democracy, most Singaporeans are pretty blank on this particular issue. Um, I don't necessarily mean this as a Western concept uh, uh, in terms of democracy. I mean this in terms of a responsibility on the, to popular welfare. Uh, uh, you can have that sometimes absent democracy. In Africa, we have learned we have to have it along with formal systems of representative democracy, the strong uh, commitment to popular welfare. Sometimes you can have democratic systems and not have this commitment to popular welfare, which we also have. But you need to have the strong element of responsibility uh, and of representation. These systems are often weak or without reform. When you get into that vicious cycle, it's very hard to imagine where you're going to make the insertion, the reformist insertion, to start getting yourself propelled in a different way. Uh, they're often characterized by countries living beyond means and countries where you can insert aid money, but it's a band-aid. It just simply plasters over the worst of the problems and doesn't manage to break that, uh, that uh, uh, compounding environment. Why is all of this important to Africa? Well, it's not just because I work and live in Johannesburg uh, and spent uh, much of my professional life uh, over the last 25 years uh, working in Africa, and nearly all of it, in fact. Uh, but it's because if you look at failure and if you look at the number of countries which are judged, and I know I've already made a, given a health warning about uh, criterion around failure, the majority of them are still today in sub-Saharan Africa. If you take the OECD grouping 23 of 28 of the so-called failed states group worldwide are from sub-Saharan Africa, or 23 of the 35 high alert countries in the failed, now fragile states index of foreign policy and the fund for peace, um, if you take Paul Collier's bottom billion, 70% of them of the 58 are from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, a lot of these countries, if you take the, the combination of the countries in the, in the failed states 
a high alert plus Paul Collier's group. It lends its, 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 it mounts to 65 countries. These are countries which receive very large amounts of aid. So this is of concern both in terms of what the effect of this aid has been and also in terms of, of, of the, the relationship that donors enjoy with these countries, uh, obtaining on average about three times the global average of aid. Most of them are low income and poor, uh, and despite the fact that we've enjoyed an unprecedented uh, era of economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 10 years, uh, poverty rates continue to go up. It's very welcome, but it hasn't proven enough, and it goes back to the job wider growth, inclusive growth uh, phenomena that we seek to achieve in Africa. Uh, many countries in Africa, of course, have some of these conditions which I've already referred to. Very high dependency on oil and gas and commodities. We essentially export what we produce and we import what we consume, by and large. Uh, another characteristic uh, of failure, indeed very common to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we have both big examples of, of, of fragility and very small examples of fragility, um, although, as I've already mentioned, bigger have generally done worse, uh, characterized overwhelmingly by very weak governance regimes, clustered at the bottom of uh, a quartile of uh, governance indicators around the world and poor records in tackling corruption. And despite the fact that we've enjoyed recent improvements, there is a historical challenge of growth in Africa. We've had a good decade it doesn't mean that this simply does away with the previous 40 years of post-independence uh, um, uh, uh, activity in, in Africa and record in Africa. And th this problem, the problems that have lent themselves to the circumstances of development in Africa are exacerbated now uh, by issues around demogra demography, urbanization, and job creation. And let me just think, talk through some of the drivers in this regard very briefly. Um, the first of these is simply the number of people we're going to have in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, of course, statistics are the first casualty of any weak and fragile environment. Uh, but we're looking to have twice as many Africans as we, in 2040 as we do today. Um, uh, and possibly four times as many if, if behavioral patterns don't change by the year 2090, according to the UN, that we do today. So... This is because, uh, and this is a much faster rate than Asia, it's because people still continue to have large numbers of children, but people are also living longer. There's a kind of double whammy in this regard. And this is going to place countries in conditions of relative stability today uh, under some stress. Tanzania, for example, is going to have a population by the turn of the century at current rates of growth, with that warning in mind, something along the lines of what the United States is, is today. Uh, Nigeria at current rates of growth, a billion people by the year 2100. Uh, hard to imagine how they're going to be accommodated unless things dramatically change. It's not just about absolute numbers, it's also about demographics. The African demographic picture is changing substantially from that in 1980 to that uh, in the next five years. Um, by 2040, 75% uh, of births uh, are going to be in sub-Saharan Africa. But it's not just about where, um, sorry, 75% of young people are going to be in sub-Saharan Africa. It's not just uh, uh, about where, uh, it's not just about absolute numbers. It's also about where people are going to be living. Africa remains relatively underpopulated, of course, as I've already pointed out, um, about half the global average. But it's a question, it's a question, as I've said, about where they're going to be. And if you take the left-hand index here, that's total population. Computer's slowing down a bit. Maybe it's just me. Oh, no. No, something, something's gone on there. Anyway, our, our demographics are going up to over 50% by 2025 uh, and 60% by 2040 in terms of people living in cities, a percentage of Africans living in cities. And the reason, unfortunately, that they live in conditions like this, anybody know where this is? No, it's Kibera in Kenya. Um, the reason why they live in conditions like this is our historical record on growth. We had uh, 10, 12 good years until uh, uh, the 1972 combination of oil price sh shocks, low commodity prices, bad governance, military regimes led to this long 20-year period of per capita income decline and then end of the Cold War, bounced off the bottom, 
and only in about 2010 did we get above the 1972 figure. Now, that's not to make a point about this. It's just essentially we lost 40 years, whereas the rest of the world was going up more or less in that way. Uh, we were going down and then have spent a long time, indeed the same period of time as the decline, recovering. And that's why there hasn't been the sort of investment in these living conditions that otherwise you would have seen. Um, compared to Southeast Asia, we've done that, pretty much flatlined uh, in GDP per capita terms. Uh, and, and that's why poverty rates of decrease, which have come down now substantially in the 1990s with higher growth and better governance, haven't had the same sort of performances as you've seen both globally or the spectacular performances of China, where 500 million people have been lifted out of poverty over the past 30 years. And it's not that I'm comparing, and I say this given where I am, Norway to Nigeria uh, here, which is often a rather extreme uh, uh, co uh, comparison to make. Um, we, even if you compare a country like Indonesia, very similar in many ways to uh, Nigeria, uh, long colonial history, longer than, of course, Nigeria's, uh, dependency on oil, uh, was one of the top five oil producers in 1941, uh, one of the reasons why I was attractive to the Japanese back in the war days, uh, um, uh, a very disparate, uh, uh, geographically discontiguous area, 13,500 islands, a period of very troubled political inheritance uh, from the independence days uh, through to the Sukarno Suharto changeover, and then you start seeing a dramatic change of Indonesian fortunes as better governance decisions with the hiccup of the Asian financial crisis were made, and compare it to Nigeria, um, uh, where you, you don't see the same sort of investment in people, and particular, this execution of policy against vision, against pronouncements constantly. So Indonesia is hardly a perfect example in this regard, uh, and this is not Norway, uh, um, clearly. But even so, its performance has been quite staggeringly better. In fact, there's a chapter in the book uh, which looks at you know, if Asia, why not Africa, in terms of historical performance. And this, of course, is compounded by the fact that not just in terms of natural resource management, but in terms of food, we have done comparatively badly too. Majority of sub-Saharan Africans remain net food importers. This is a circumstance that's going to have to change. Otherwise, these compounding factors that I've already alluded to become uh, quite dramatically negative, uh, and that's what we have done in terms of cereal yields for a whole variety of reasons. Let me then turn to, this is why it's important for Africa, let me turn to thinking about their remedy. Now, we often think of dealing with state recovery in very extreme terms. Clearly, there's a spectrum for recovery just as there's a spectrum for failure and decline. You know, people often think about regime change as they think about state recovery. I spent a little bit of time in Libya last year. That's obviously a very extreme example, and we can talk about that. There's a chapter in there uh, uh, as to why it has gone so badly, and you shouldn't have believed otherwise. Um, uh, but it's not just about these extreme actions. It's about the entire spectrum when we think about uh, recovery. Let me make at the outset a number of different uh, points about this. Um, even for those who uh, ended up using the military uh, as the nation-building tool of choice uh, in terms of recovery, uh, in terms of tr transforming the conditions in states, uh, they were, at the outset, lest I remind them, extremely skeptical uh, about their value. And we should be no less skeptical, perhaps a whole lot more skeptical than even George W. Bush was at the turn of the century. The practical challenges of state building, which is often required in these conditions, uh, are that this is a very long, difficult, messy, uh, problematic, uh, um, often violent and confusing process. And for outsiders to come into it, it proves often to be all of those things, which is why so few people have the stomach to stay the course over the long term. We often, we have to, and this is what the book sets out to do, have to understand also why we get it so badly wrong most of the time. We always go, and I mean we, the international community, goes into these missions believing that this time it'll be different. 
How many times have you heard that? This time it'll be different. We've learned the lessons of the past. We're going to do a much better job in pick your country uh, than we managed to do previously. And it, be it begs the question, why then would we get it so badly wrong and why this time will it fundamentally be different? And where it's often said to be different is in terms of getting the formula right. There is a notion out there that when it comes to recovery from an outsider's perspective, that we go in, we, we have this list of things that we have to do, often tabulated and nicely sequenced with a whole series of timelines. The Afghan National Development Strategy is a classic example in this regard, wonderfully laid out by a whole variety of consultants, normally again, who look something like me, and they go and they say, this is what you need to do to improve governance and state capacity. Um, these are the laws that you require. These are the reforms that have to be pushed through, so on and so on and so on. These are the timelines. These are the resources that you need, objectives, priorities, processes, etc. It's what the military refers to as a campaign plan. I've been listening to the radio about dealing with ISIL. And one of the solutions to dealing with ISIL is apparently to mentor and strengthen the Iraqi and Free Syrian Army response. Well, I ask myself that after 11 years of trying to strengthen the Iraqi military, why suddenly are you going to be able to do this much better than you were able to do in the previous decade? What, has been, what is going to be done differently in the case of improving the response capability of the Iraqi military that wasn't able already to be done with the expenditure of vast amounts of resources? Clearly, something else is missing in this equation. It's not just about getting resources and staffing right. It's about getting uh, um, other factors correct. It's not just about outsiders getting their bits of the equation. It's about the legitimacy of domestic actors. It's about uh, um, soft, systemic infrastructure, not just about the delivery of schools, roads, bridges, etc. It's about how you use them, how you operate them. It's about the emergence of issue-based politics over identity-based politics, um, and so on and so forth. And fundamentally, it's about how the political economy is ordered, about why economic and developmental choices are made in a particular way, um, what we would term the political economy uh, and the relationship with local politics that is fundamental to the success or failure in terms of this process of recovery. Just as you have a spectrum of failure, you clearly have a spectrum of intervention. At one in, a, a, a extreme, of course, is a UN operation or a military intervention. A UN operation is usually synonymous with conditions of failure, of course. Um, uh, and further along the spectrum, indeed in that category too, you have uh, um, uh, the aid industry, in inverted commas, uh, playing its part. Uh, and we need to think very carefully about what part this industry plays and what the effects, both good and deleterious, are of this industry. It is a very substantial amount of money that is flying around in this context. We have to think about what sort of incentives it provides to local and foreign actors involving themselves in these circumstances. It's about 26 billion US dollars in sub-Saharan Africa. A substantial sum, as I both to the giver and to the recipient. 30 billion to LDCs. Uh, a big percentage of this, of course, is, is, is retained by the givers themselves. It's a big industry back home for them too. China, of course, has changed the nature of this industry quite fundamentally over the past um, uh, decade in particular, uh, with uh, a pledging of about 200 billion US dollars, uh, although it spends uh, only a fraction of that, and I'll come back to this in a second. Um, this is a substantial part of the recovery equation. Um, and if you look at where this money goes, uh, about a third of it's in bilateral cooperation, sorry, sorry, two-thirds of it in bilateral cooperation, a third in multilateral, and, and then there's a sliver in humanitarian aid, uh, and then a sliver also in debt relief. But a constant ramping up in this process of aid figures or ODA figures worldwide. China, of course, is the big change in this regard, how it has changed, although I think it's often overstated how much the Chinese give. Uh, the cumulative delivered amount at about 100 billion is quite less, a lot less than the aid pledging amount uh, 
Um, so they like to say what they're going to do much more than actually deliver it on the ground. But it seldom addresses the failure, despite the volumes, the failure of politics uh, and of leadership. Um, I've said politics twice there, it's not meant to be that way. It's about the failure of politics and leadership, and in fact, may well distort matters. As I've said, moving along the spectrum, uh, you have, of course, um, African uh, and other peacekeeping missions. Uh, there's a chapter devoted to Amasom in Somalia, which I think, certainly by comparison to earlier missions, has been a success. Questions about sustainability of that success, I think, should be asked. Uh, and then, of course, you have the impact of sanctions. Uh, I take a, a slightly more jaundiced view about sanctions than most. Um, uh, and this is a picture. Anybody have an idea where this is? This is the rail yard in Bulawayo. Not doing too well at the moment. Um, uh, and this is not to link sanctions with the performance of the Zimbabwe economy like Robert Mugabe would like to do. But it's just to say that I think in the case of Zimbabwe, often sanctions has been used as an excuse as to why things are going so badly rather than um, uh, as a useful tool to move things along in the right direction. And of course, you have at the other end the extreme uh, of regime change. Let me conclude or get towards the end by taking five different examples of recovery just as a taster of the 40 or so case studies that exist in this book. The first of these is one where there has scarcely been any international intervention in Somaliland. Now, I'm not saying that things are going swimmingly well in Somaliland, but certainly by comparison to Somalia, they are. Uh, Somaliland has managed extraordinarily over the last 20 years, in spite of the absence of the international community, by and large. There's about, compared to the, uh, I think it's uh, $25 million dollars a, uh, is it a week of aid flows to Somalia. They get about 120 million US dollars annually in Somaliland, and that's only recently reached those sorts of figures. Ostensibly, they have built their peace based on local ownership of the process. There was no grand conference. There was no Sun City. There was no Cadessa in a sense, of people sponsoring these grand conferences. Uh, there was, they had their own Cadessa. It happened uh, in a whole set of uh, places in Somaliland from the early 1990s over the course of three or four years. Uh, and lest us forget that they come from a very violent and uh, um, a violent history where despite the fact that they were said to be the second star in the five stars of Somalia, at Siad Barre's Air Force, and this is why the uh, major monument in Hargesa is a, an old MiG, Siad Barra's Air Force took off from Hargesa and bombed the local population of Hargesa. I'm not sure how many times in history that has happened, where the Air Force bombed its own people from the very town that it was taking off from, but it comes from a very violent history. Maybe it's because of that. It may be because of the relative ethnic unity that this is an isakh uh, based area, uh, that it had a British uh, form of colonial identity. They left the local traditions in place and they ruled indirectly in, uh, in Somaliland up until 1960 in independence, is that the Somalis were able, in spite of the cost of war, in spite of the long war with uh, Siad Barre, to develop their own peace. This, you would have to agree, is a long way from the hotels of Kenya, where the Somali peace was hammered out along with large per diems, large incentives for people to be there. It's a long way away from Sun City, uh, where some of the Congolese peace talks were held. This is in Birao. This is the building in which the major peace agreement was signed in Somaliland. Where in, in these peace conferences, they camped out for five, six months sometimes, under canvas, women bringing them their food, uh, and look from, derived from local resources and hammered out their differences. Um, uh, and that's not to say, as I've said already, they don't have all sorts of problems. This is from the airport, just to give you an idea of the extent of the problems. Um, uh, um, but what, whatever the problems, despite the poverty, they do own their peace. Um, uh, despite the fact that they receive, or maybe because of the fact they receive relatively small dollops of aid, uh, um, uh, they uh, have made maximum use of the aid and of the diaspora money that comes flowing in. They certainly are weaker than most people would 
like to believe that they are, uh, that they, they can't really be left alone uh, without international recognition, I would argue. Um, but the fact is, uh, their ownership has enabled in 20 years a substantial transformation on this process of recovery. A second example, as I've already intimated, I've spent a lot of time, is Colombia. Fifteen years ago, Colombian politicians described their own country as a failed state. It's not the terminology that you would use with Colombia today. It was a state that was commonly seen as one akin to the antics of Pablo Escobar, uh, the Robin Hood, as he, some people like to see him of Medellin. Uh, um, but it's moved a long way since that period. Uh, it was one where the political economy was seen as plato or plomo, lead or silver. And that was the term that Pablo Escobar used. If you, if you come with me, you get silver. If you don't, you get lead. Very stark choice. Or blanco y nio, of white and black. A black espresso and a white line of cocaine. These were the enduring images of Colombia just 15 years ago. So what happened? Well, it um, managed to halve its homicide rate, acquire conditions relatively of political stability, uh, whereas in 2000, 95% uh, of municipalities were not free from violence. Most of them couldn't actually operate uh, of the 1,100 municipalities. Today, only 5% have problems in operation. Economic growth has been high, including the largest foreign investor in South African breweries uh, in the country. And ostensibly, this has been down to different presidential-led policies and politics, displaying extraordinary attention to detail. First with Alvaro Uribe and subsequently with Juan Manuel Santos. Uh, but it came in on the back of Andres Pastrana, who of course tried the major peace agreement uh, at the end of the 1990s with the FARC uh, and with the uh, EPON. Uh, and when that failed, he initiated Plan Colombia and it was taken forward by Uribe and Santos. And as I said, the key element here is attention to detail. Uribe used to visit every municipal or a municipality every weekend for his two presidential terms. This was not a man who stayed in his palace. He was out there understanding where the problems were and extending governance. Uh, as I said, it was estimated that 75% that of Colombia was not reached by the state in 2000. Today, you wouldn't say that at all. Of course, there are major challenges there of backfilling, and there are major challenges of finally having a peace uh, with the FARC. And of course, this is part of the process underway currently in Havana. There's major challenges of backfilling behind what the armed forces have been able to do. But also one of the key areas, I think, uh, and I know that this is always uncomfortable for civilians, but one of the key things that Colombia teaches us is that when particularly you face an insurgency, it's of the importance of having effective armed forces. You can't do very much if the armed forces aren't effective in terms of the peace uh, process that you're trying to enter into. I'm going to just touch on Afghanistan, um, uh, but I think this has been an aid, an international community environment on steroids. This has been... Uh, where the, uh, a huge amount of aid has often been uh, very poorly uh, distributed, and of course we know the circumstances historically. But it does illustrate the basic challenges of the Western state-building approach uh, to stabilization. Aid and money, that aid and money is not the problem per se, not least because countries themselves, of course, never develop through aid. Aid, as I put in the book, can make a difference. Uh, but it's not the principal route for development. It always seems to surprise me that donors somehow believe that the countries that they give money to are going to develop in a different way that they themselves developed in. Why is it? I don't know. But perhaps they have be believed their own rhetoric in this regard. It's a often a very perverse tautology in the aid environment in Afghanistan, uh, where the aim is to simply farm the aid rather than try and improve the effects of the aid in the process. And this leads to competitive aid between nations and what I would term engagement fratricide, uh, where you know simply the recipient partner is overwhelmed 
by the sheer volume of aid in this envir environment, and that often the aid givers themselves and the sectors in which they give become exceptionally tribalized, and they become articles of faith. People give money to certain things simply because they believe uh, in those certain things, rather, even when um, the evidence points in other directions. It's often distorted, too, by the importance of having a security imperative. There's a very short-termist view rather than a developmental view. Um, and the seed programs, for example, in Kandahar, which I deal with in the book, are a classic pro uh, uh, example in this regard. And it's often, and Afghanistan is not unique in this regard, where aid is given to the wrong people, and you know that they're the wrong people precisely because of their proximity to power. Uh, and one of the things that I was involved in, again, this is reflected in the book, uh, is how you um, often focus on the wrong areas in terms of providing better security uh, and the choice between going after drugs uh, and then providing vast amounts of money uh, through trucking contracts uh, and other uh, areas of multilateral, multinational expenditure, which provided vast amounts more money uh, into the uh, uh, into the worst areas of uh, governance uh, than did drugs. I spent a lot of time uh, in the last couple of years in Malawi working with the lady in the middle, uh, Joyce Bunder, and I want to just use this, and this is my bad example, uh, as to how difficult it is to, to change these environments. Um, Malawi uh, has done relatively poorly in terms of per capita GDP performance, if this is the African average, the graph that I showed you earlier, that's Malawi's record. It's extremely poor, even by African standards, uh, um, in terms of, of, of its, of its uh, record of, uh, of economic growth. If it's going to reach mid lower middle income status, which is currently pegged at $1,000, it's going to have to grow its economy at rates that it hasn't been able to manage. So even if it's to be slightly less than the most poor, putting it slightly differently, it's going to have to do things that it's never done before um, uh, and, it's, uh, and, and exhibit the sort of growth that it's never been possible to do. And if, even if you, and if you look at um, GDP per capita, Malawi uh, has fallen, and I'm not measuring this against uh, um, South Korea or uh, Singapore or even Vietnam, I'm measuring against the country next door, um, which for some reason, hasn't appeared on my slide, but uh, it's fallen as a, a percentage of, of um, Mozambique constantly to over 100 around 150 percent to around uh, 55 percent over the course of 20 years. And one of the reasons for this is this constant rate of population increase, from four million uh, under four million at independence uh, to around 15 million, 14, 15 million today, to reach around 50 million at current rates of growth um, in, uh, in 2050. I remember giving this presentation to the president, then president, President Banda, and she said, that'll never happen. And I said, well, why won't it happen? I said, the parents of the 50 millionth Malawian have probably already been born. No, she said, it can't happen. And it's that sort of denialism, frankly, that is going to lead exactly to these sorts of circumstances. You're going to have to put things in place to ensure that this does not occur quite in this way because already the pressure on land in, in Malawi is considerable and the environmental consequences of this are dramatic, especially around the lake. ODA, although it's increased constantly, hasn't really made a difference. It's gone up roughly at the same rates that it's gone up to all of Southern Africa. Um, and it's because these conditions exist, and it's proven very difficult to deal with this in, re in reform terms. The private sector is hugely crowded out. One of the reasons why it's crowded out is interest rates are very high, because the government is constantly borrowing in the economy. Why is it constantly borrowing in the economy? Because it's meeting the salaries of 200,000 bureaucrats every month. And they can't deal with the volumes because if they did that, it would be politically suicidal. So you've got a huge bureaucracy and you can't downsize the bureaucracy because you will then face uh, a political revolt. It's a very much a middleman rent-seeking economy where corruption is institutionalized. Uh, there's a pernicious allowance culture in the part of the government. 
incentives are very skewed. The incentive is not to be in the private sector where you'll earn more better salary. The incentive is to be in government. That's where you'll make your cut. That's how you will operate. Um, there's obviously in this in very poor environment, huge donor province, uh, prominence, but they're not acting largely as developmental partners in conditions of weak governance. And this is replicated across many environments. They're acting as supervisory agencies. And this leads to a very poor relationship with the government. It's a very unproductive as well as a very uh, uh, tense relationship. And overall transformation, getting themselves out of this declining picture. As I say, I'm not measuring it by South Korean standards. I'm measuring this against the country next door, which is also very poor, requires a total relooking at the way in which Malawians look at each other uh, and not to be so fatalistic about their, about their plight. And then finally, I'm going to end, and this has good and bad elements. That's another health warning ambassador with South Africa, my own country. And I think, and I spent some time talking to F.W. de Klerk among the 20 or so heads of government that were interviewed in the course of putting this book together um, about understanding what motivated him uh, uh, in terms uh, and how he ran his side of the um, negotiation process is, is it peace, and these are the key lessons about South Africa's conflict resolution experience, is it peace is possible only when all sides want to, peace more than they want to continue to fight. If one side wants to continue to fight, you won't have peace. I know it sounds like the blindingly obvious, but it's not always followed. We try and incentivize people to end fighting, but if they really believe that the route to political power exists through fighting or, or through defending, uh, then you're not going to have peace. You need equal international and regional pressure on the parties to go to the negotiating table and to conclude that peace. And we had that in the early 1990s in South, in South Africa. excuse me. And you need, of course, leadership. You need method. You need courage. And you need timing. And we're fortunate enough to have it in bucketfuls in the early 1990s. Of course, there were wobbles. They always are in these processes, but you needed, I believe, those three critical components to conflict resolution to make this happen. But it does not mean that it's over at that point. South Africa's transition did not end on the 28th of April, the day after elections in 1994. That was just the start, in a sense, or the next moment of a transitionary process. Reconciliation is not an event. It's like democracy. It's not just the truth and reconciliation process, do that and close the book. It has to be constantly and always worked on. Um, economic development is not just done when you have a political, uh, a, a, a democratic election. It's a long-term process of change. And as I've already mentioned, these are as long as the processes that give rise to them in the first instance. We have very difficult problems of job creation in South Africa, structural unemployment of around one-third of our population. Um, uh, we have real problems, and that relates to the challenge we have of diversification, diversifying our economy and of competitiveness. And this, of course, links with the nature of the political makeup of the ruling uh, uh, tri tripartite alliance. When you have trade unions in your government, it's very difficult to reduce the minimum wage to get more people jobs. I, I, I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing, but it's just that is what it is. It's very hard to bring your unions along into a, a process which is going to essentially undermine their constituency. And as a country thus, because of these long-term challenges of both negatives and positives, and let me just briefly touch on the negatives. Corruption is part of increasingly of our political culture. It's part of the culture, it, it's fed off the culture of expectations um, and it feeds off a lack of accountability. Uh, key institutions are being seen as being roughshod over, uh, run roughshod over, not least parliament and the relationship with the executive. The economy may have two point something percent growth this year, that's not enough to meet those aspirations that I referred to a moment ago. Absolutely not enough. We have problems in our foreign policy, I would argue, in keeping some of the company that we keep. 
Um, and crime and violence remain endemic to our society. There are 47 murders a day in South Africa. We are more or less the rape capital of the world. And it's part of a, a culture of lawlessness and a culture that relates to the way in which South African men, of which I am one, relate to women. And the chauvinism and the view of power that goes with that, undoubtedly. And there's no indication of a plan. So those are all the negatives. And every one of these circumstances, every one of these countries, you could draw up a similar, I'm sure, set of negatives. But because this is my own country, uh, country I'm bearing all, as it were, here. But there are many po uh, positives. We've had an extraordinary record in alleviating poverty over the past 15 years. We've gone from nearly half of our population living in conditions of structural poverty and through a considered and considerate welfare system now with 16 million South Africans, we have reduced that to around 10% of the population. That is a massive achievement coming from where we came from. We have a democratic culture. I can say these things in front of the ambassador and she won't kill me. She might kill me afterwards, but she won't kill me now. Um, we have a strong democratic culture and a very strong civil society, uh, including the media. And so we debate these things very openly. And these are key elements as to why those circumstances don't give rise to widespread instability and violence. There's extraordinary political innovation and dynamism. So I see, for example, the rise of the EFF in South Africa. I'm sure you know about the EFF, guys in red overalls in Parliament, led by Julius Malema as a reflection of the political innovation of South Africans. I don't see it as a bad thing. It may be a destructive force in many ways, but it's part of our, our makeup. It's part of the fact that we are responding through democratic institutions in a particular way. We have world-class businesses. And despite government, we remain a draw card from sport to terrorism. And I say it's despite government in question mark because I think often it's because of government we remain this draw card. So let me make some conclusions. Ten quick takeaways. When, why states recover is success like failure is down to politics. It's about getting the political part of the equation right. You need to put people first. You do this generally through democracies. In Asia, they have a very strong commitment to popular welfare, which means in cases they can do this, and a ruthless pragmatism, by the way, too. But they can do this without what we would see as Western systems of democracy. Security is the door through which all else follows. It's very hard to have recovery if you don't have basic security. And national security as well as security at the local level. And effective armed forces, and by that I mean it, including the police, are key in this. And it's often very hard for civilians to accept that. Local ownership is an obvious one. You must institutionalize and not personalize. You don't go build institutions around key people. There's a big debate in South Africa at the moment about the role of the public protector in the form of one woman. And I think that's wrong. I think we should be talking about the office of the public protector, not just the individual in that regard. There's a real danger as we always make these things into sort of uh, mythological characterizations, personifications of individuals. We've got to have, and we know what the economic policies for success are. I mean, you need policies for a, a color digital flat screen age. You don't need policies for a black and white TV age, because we don't want to buy black and white TVs, at least I don't. Um, you, need, you need policies, that we, and we know what those are, that deliver growth. And you've got to have a good crisis. Particularly those countries that have failed economically and are cycling towards violence and instability, you've got to use that moment of crisis to do things that you could otherwise not do. And the lesson across the board is that you've got to have a good crisis whether it be Costa Rica or Vietnam or Singapore or wherever. Reform is fundamentally like an iceberg. In the policy advisory business, we always focus on the top part because it's the bit that we can see and we can manipulate and manage. And we go, oh, we'll shape this policy here and this way there. But actually, we need to spend our time understanding what exists under the, uh, under the waterline. And that's issues around politics, as I've already mentioned. It's mindset, it's informal rules, it's customs, it's cultural aspects, um, it's personalities. You, it's not just about dealing with the stuff at the top. It's about dealing with the stuff under the waterline. 
You must think of states and interventions along a spectrum. It's not one thing. It's different things at different moments. Um, there's a fundamental need to think things through to the finish. There's often a drive to become involved. And we were with one of the Director Generals of Foreign Policy, this, uh, of Foreign Affairs this morning, to talk, th there's an urge because of political constituency at home to do something. You've got to do something. And very seldom do politicians, because they don't think very, very much about next week, there's very little urge to think things through to the finish. What's the finish look like? How do we get out of here? Uh, what's the nature of the exit strategy involved? We always think about the entrance and the nature of the entrance. We don't think about the nature of the exit. Who here has thought about the nature of the exit from ISIS? The ISIS engagement? Nobody, I don't think. Not that I've read. And leadership is key at every level. It's often thought that you know, that the, the big man or woman at the top is the one that's going to make all the difference. You need a benign dictator, Lee Kuan Yew style. And I think that that does the notion of reform in government and recovery in government a great disservice. Lee Kuan Yew's tenure in my book illustrates this through interviews with the former president of uh, Singapore, amongst others, was characterized by huge debate and arguments within his cabinet constantly about challenges over different ideas. And he picked the best and brightest people around him. It was not one individual, although he became the face of Singapore abroad. There were many other people in that institutional fabric working very hard all the time. Leadership is crucial, but it's leadership at every level all the way down to the bottom. Let me end there. Thanks very much. Checking that this works. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for a very insightful and interesting um, presentation. Um, it doesn't make my task any less daunting. I thought this book was daunting in itself to be a discussion on because it's very well researched and has an ambitious scope dealing with some 30 cases. But it's also a pleasure, not least because, in my opinion, you've got the research question spot on. It's, I think it's so good to focus on the positive. Well, academics, we tend to deconstruct and problematize and we forget to build up and take it somewhere. And I think your question, why stays recover, is really very good. I will not attempt to um, comment on all the cases in your book because I haven't been there and I think it is important to see real people in real places before you talk about them So, I, and I haven't been in most of the places so I'll not comment on them. Um, I would rather focus on some of the issues that you raise in your book and related to the question of whether externals should get involved and if so what should they do and it's partly because it relates a lot to my own research and the work in our research groups, who works on peace operations and peace building. Um, and one of your central messages is that recovery is really up to the local population. The insiders are as responsible for the recovery as they are for the decline, since it's local politics, customs and rules that shapes their choices. And foreigners cannot want peace as much as the locals. I think this is a very s important message. Um, the, t the key determin determinant of success or failure is less the assistance of the international community um, than the willingness and ability of the locals to seize the opportunity that the international, in the international community creates when they create kind of a moment of stability, as you term it. So, as I understand, you argue that the less foreigners do, the better. But you also emphasize that there is a moral imperative to do something. And that's something that resonates with me and our work. Um, 
not only to talk the talk, but also to walk the walk when it comes to supporting values, human rights, and the global responsibility that we have towards each other. So what is enough? What should external actors do? Um, I won't go into what you say about this in all your cases, of course, but you seem to focus more on what the international community do wrong or get wrong than what they get right. And I think in the spirit of your <laughs> title, it would be good if you could, if I could tease out some more what they actually could contribute with. Uh, you don't seem to contest the underpinning values of international communities' current involvement in fragile states. You, you argue that democracy and liberal economies are the central to peace and stability and, and growth. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but you question how it goes about doing or supporting these values. You say that uh, security is an imperative. Uh, for better governance and development. And uh, my question is really, can outsiders help in this regard to help create the moment of stability, as you call it? Is there any value in what did they do at the moment to help train effective forces and security sector reform? Other ways they can do this differently? Um, and are there some key pointers there that could direct us <laughs> and our work in this field. Um, and you, uh, in, when you talk about democracy, you described policy matters as the tip of the, the iceberg, while below is culture, mindset, customs, tradition, and politics. And uh, you say that democracy requires hard work by civil society and parliamentary opposition. And other ways that international community can support these key actors. Um, those seeking to influence these countries in a positive direction, you say, have to show that the macro democracy, rule of law, and liberal democracy makes sense. Liberal economy makes sense. How should this be done in a way that does not smell of imperialism, or at least some imposition of external values? And the same goes for redistribution, which is a difficult question in most countries, I would say. How can external actors start talking about these matters? In much uh, thinking around peace building, local ownership is emphasized, but it is often seen as selling the external idea. They, the, the International actors come in with an idea of what needs to be done, and they're selling that idea to create local ownership. Whereas you argue um, more for local involvement, local initiative, and locally driven processes. How can external people help initiate these processes? Must there be a good crisis, or are there other ways? Do any of your cases show that there are other ways than having a good crisis? And um, you also talk about identity politics and the importance for bringing uh, politics from a focus on identity into a focus on issues. And in most, or in many, many places where there are violent conflict, identity is crucial. And it's very difficult for outsiders to grasp the importance. It can seem so banal. The, the differences that are so central to the actors involved. Um, and I can think of, I did my uh, the doctoral research on Macedonia. And an important issue there was uh, university education for Albanians through the Albanian language. And the donors that came there, they could not understand the importance of that. So their solution was to have an, an English language university. And Somehow they thought that should solve the problem. And of course, partly it was helpful because the Albanians didn't need to go to a Macedonian language university, but it's, it made it very clear to me that it's so hard to grasp the importance of these questions. And so how do external actors deal with these central issues while 
maintaining the um, importance of identity, bringing it to uh, well, maturing the political system into issue, pol uh, issue politics. Um, last question is, um, you say that context is key, that need to take into account this situation to avoid template use. And as we know, whether it's the UN or the uh, organizations coming into a conflict, there's great turnover of people, there's scarce time, they come in. There's such an urge to, to just repeat what they did before, even if it didn't work <laughs> properly. Are there any commonalities, do you see, that can be used as lenses or hooks to put activities on without using a template. Um, I think I'll leave it there and leave some room for questions for others. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Greg, for this very complex but still very clear presentation. And thank you, Eli, for very uh, thought-provoking, good uh, questions. Um, while I normally would have given you now the chance to answer some of them, I think um, given uh, the time frame of this seminar, I think I will, if that is okay with you, open up the floor for questions and comments. And then if you can gather up some of them and answer a selection, I guess, at the end, if that's okay. Most of the ones I can. Yes, <laughs> that is great. Okay, uh, when you um, get the microphone, could you please just uh, raise up and um, uh, tell your name? Sure, uh, thank thanks. Uh, I have a comment, uh, Pia is etc. I'm a political scientist, currently independent expert, uh, former advisor to the Norwegian Chief of Defense. Uh, from October 2007 to July 2011, it was my job to manage the Norwegian force contributions to Afghanistan, uh, to ISAF and later also the NATO training mission Afghanistan. Uh, as the Norwegian international community is now leaving Afghanistan, I really hope our efforts will prove to be worthwhile. <coughs> the Kingdom of Norway have lost 10 soldiers in this war, believing they were making a better and more peaceful world. Should this mission not be successful, the loss of our soldiers would be an even greater tragedy. Thanks. Are there anyone else who would jump in now? Uh, it's a very short, uh, Francis Stevens, uh, George. Um, I, I have um, a comment and a question. The comment is, um, uh, Greg talked about ownership of the peace, and I do agree with you. And I think a very good example would be in Sierra Leone. Uh, in 2002, we made one attempt at uh, peace for the, to the civil war, and that lasted compared to Liberia, in which they had several attempts and it didn't work. Uh, it would be interesting what lessons can we draw, because often uh, one is asked, you know, what happened in Sierra Leone uh, as opposed to Liberia? And my answer usually is that because we wanted peace, but also I think because the problem was not really what one might characterize as a civil war in the sense that you know, people internally went at each other. There was, you know, the library. And then my question to Ellie is that you, you uh, maybe I heard wrong, but you seem to emphasize or uh, question a bit international intervention as opposed to, um, you said, local in the peace, uh, peace building. Um, but uh, why don't you also think of regional uh, uh, into because oftentimes when we say outsiders, we think of, you know, foreigners, excuse the language, but a regional intervention is probably even more crucial 
today. In Afghanistan, I think um, Pakistan has, in my view, largely been ignored until lately. Uh, and of course, in the Middle East now with Iraq and Iraq, those are worse in West Africa, the regional body ECOWAS was one reason why the peace was uh, so successful in Sierra Leone. So perhaps that you might want to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we will take one last comment and or a question there to the gentleman. Hi. Um, you told us that in some of these failed states there have been um, yeah, severe like ethnical or religious tension. Uh, but could you t tell us a bit more about uh, the recovered states, like how uh, the recovered states have dealt with the ethnical or religious tension? Uh, what are like the factors behind the success stories? Okay, I think we have so many questions now, so I think I will give you the opportunity to start answering. Great. Would you like to go first? Because then. Yeah, because now we can do this over two. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, there are regional dimensions to many crises and tensions. Uh, there are regional dimensions to many crises, and of course, that should be taken into account. It was not my uh, intention to keep that out. I think actually Greg has a very interesting point uh, when it comes to a regional focus uh, to the I guess at the cost of local. So you can carry on that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the questions and, and again thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and anyway, anyway when I looked at the time I realized I've been rabbiting on far too long and cut into the uh, discussion time. And on the point on Afghanistan I'm, I, I, I am actually uh, counter to most views, fairly optimistic about uh, Afghanistan. Um, and I'm fairly optimistic, given recent heart, it has to be said, by the fact that uh, Mr. Ghani and Mr. Abdullah could actually hammer out their differences in a fairly mature way, um, it seems, um, uh, and uh, keep the, the political system moving forward. But even between the first time I was there in 2006, and the last time in 2012, it was a different country. It was a different country. You know, there's, I don't know, I can't remember the exact statistic. It's in the book, but it's something in the order of 20 million Afghans have access to cell phones. You know, even if you had to have a significant decline or change in the, in the political and security environment, it's very hard to put that back into the box. That's not going to change. And that has dramatically changed the way in which people do business, the way in which they interact with each other. It's dramatically empowered women uh, um, in the process. I mean, that is one of many, many changes which have occurred in Afghanistan, which, like frogs in the, you know, in the pot, we often don't see because we're slowly being boiled and we don't see these things. It takes going back to a place to see the dramatic changes that have, can occur. And, and uh, we were asked this question yesterday. I, I think... Uh, a positive solution uh, in Afghanistan may not be perfect in, in the, through the eyes of Washington or maybe even Oslo, um, but it may look like something that you have in Iraq. Um, it, there's a fairly benign uh, political influence. It, there may be levels of corruption which we would find unacceptable, but generally, by and large, it functions fairly effectively. There's a good local economy going. There's value addition. There's considerable trade with the one regional actor. Um, now, it may not be a palatable regional actor to some parts of the world, but it has a very good and generally positive influence on that uh, part of the country. So it, it's, it's how the international community looks and where it sets the bar in terms of understanding how acceptable the outcome is. We often have, that th I think, the wrong prism by which we look at the issues of success and failure. I don't think we should simply say that that's good enough for the Afghans. Not, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is what is possible in the circumstances, given the fact that this is an enormously large territory, very sparsely populated, where communities of people don't often have connections with each other. You have this great big mountain range running down the second. Um, uh, and it, it, it's, I, I think sometimes we think we're going to leave Afghanistan as some sort of uh, um, image uh, uh, of ourselves uh, within the country. And I think it's going to be different. Uh, uh, but I do think we often uh, do not uh, ascribe to it the successes and changes that have been made over the past 10 years. 
Have they been fast enough? Probably not. Have they been enough? That's a different question. And I think the one big change that has happened, uh, which is different to Soviet times, um, uh, has been the fact that the Afghan national security forces are left now in a far more, uh, I think, uh, uh, combat effective and capable uh, uh, position than they have ever been uh, in recent history. So is it going to be enough? I think we'll, we'll see. But I, th I think we, we tend to overlook the changes. On the issue of, of regionalism, uh, there's sometimes a notion out there that regional actors know better, that uh, they're no less foreigners than those that come from with outside of those regional contexts. And often they are just as foreign uh, um, and often have very negative quite narrow interests in intervening, which are not you know, broadly ascribed to the interests of the country at large. And I think there's always a danger uh, in simply saying, oh, regional is better than international, or that regional isn't international. Uh, and one only has to think of some of the interests of the region in the Congo, for example, to think that not always do regional interests, uh, are they always benign uh, and uh, objective in the in the in the in the in the uh, in the interests of the country into which they are intervening, um, and there's this notion too that somehow they understand the country better uh, um, uh, than than outsiders, and that's also not often the case. I don't know if that's the point that uh, you wanted me to make, but uh, um, uh, I, I just on the issue of of um, of Sierra Leone, one of the interviews I did, uh, w and I guess you're from Sierra Leone, are you? Yeah. I interviewed uh, Valentine Strasser in the book, um, just to show that I wasn't frightened of interviewing some of the bad guys along with the good guys. And uh, it was fascinating, because I went out uh, um, to, to and tracked him down, it took me the uh, best part of, a, of, of the time that I was in Sierra Leone actually to determine where he was. And I found him playing drafts in a rural lit setting. I won't say where, you'll have to read the book for that. And it was the way in which he had accepted completely the changes that had been brought upon, upon or in Sierra Leone, which was so gratifying, that he 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 was completely comfortable about what he had done, where he had come from, uh, um, what had happened in Sierra Leone, and totally adjusted mentally to the new order, uh, which really for me was an indication, amongst other things, of how much the country had moved on since uh, his his uh, his bloody rule uh, way back when. Um, how to deal with ethnic tensions and religious tensions? Uh, I think that's a, you know incredibly important question. I mean, you can do it by quotas. You can do it by, you do it fundamentally by recognizing that these things exist. Uh, 